Good morning. It's so good to be with you, whether you're in the building or joining us online. And if we've not met before, my name's Sean, I and mean, I'm part of the church family here at St. Mary's. I mean, it's so good to gather together, isn't it, to worship I mean, the living God. I mean, whether you feel ready for it and up for it, you've had a, a great week, or more you've not, it's good to, to gather together. Um, I've got a question to get our minds thinking and to get us um, mentally agile. My question is, what's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in all of creation? What's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in um, all of creation? Why don't you have a, a think and if you're near someone and perhaps you could share it with them, and let them know. It's hard to single out one single thing, isn't it? And often we're torn between many things. Um, I had the joy of being camping um, in the last week, joy or, or sorrow, depending on where you sit. And with that came being up rather early in the morning. I'm often seeing the sunrise and the beautiful sun. Um, and also seeing the wonderful Welsh countryside. It wasn't that beautiful, but on the other hand, there's many other things we could single out as being beautiful. Well, we worship the God who created them all and the God who is in charge of them all. And we were made to, to praise him along with all creation. And Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaim his handiwork. And the God made it all and is in control of it all. And Colin Bourne is joining us this morning to continue our series in, in Joshua 10. And we'll be thinking a bit about how the Lord is um, sovereign in control of all. And so we're going to start our service this morning, our act of worship to the God who is in control by joining in and um, singing the hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, um, reminding us that we join in all of creation, praising our one true living God. Um, so why don't we stand or sit however is most comfortable for us as we sing together. Um, Him. 
stand on him, cast your care. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. their Creator bless, and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit Father God, we do um, give you thanks and praise because you are worthy of um, all, all our thanks and praise. Father, help us now um, and in the weeks and months ahead to bring you praise with our lives, with our words and our actions, that we might live for your praise and glory. Help us by your spirit to do that. For we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please do have a seat. We've just been singing about how all of creation praises the, the Lord, how um, it is right and fit to do so. And, but we also know, um, as Christians, that that's not our natural inclination to bring the Lord praise. And our natural um, inclination, uh, the nature of our heart, is to bring ourselves praise. But the Lord is gracious and forgiving. He is gracious and kind that all those who call on his Son, he forgives he invites to, to praise him once again and to know him deeply as Father. And so to remind us that we don't gather because we're great, because we naturally praise God, but to remind us of our need for forgiveness, our need of a renewal and reconciliation to worship God. We're going to confess that together and confess our sins together and as we prepare to, to worship God. And some words will come up on the screen. If you join in the words in bold, I'll lead us in, in the other words. Human sin disfigures the whole of creation, which groans with eager longing for God's redemption. We confess our sins in penitence and faith. We confess our sins and the sins of our society in the misuse of God's creation. God our Father, we are sorry for the times when we have used your gifts carelessly and acted ungratefully. Hear our prayer and in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We enjoy the fruits of the harvest, but sometimes forget that you have given them to us. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We belong to a people who are full and satisfied, but ignore the cry of the hungry. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We are thoughtless and do not care enough for the world that you have made. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We store up goods for ourselves alone as if there were no God and no heaven. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We say those words with confidence knowing that the Lord is gracious, that he will forgive us. Psalm 103 verse 12 tells us that as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And so we can pray with confidence that may the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're going to end this time of prayer together. And by praying the collect for the day together, it should come up on the screen. God of constant mercy, you sent your Son to save us. Remind us of your goodness. 
increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As the Lord forgives us, he invites us into a relationship with him and to know him as Father through his Son and in his Spirit. And a part of what that means is to, to hear from his word, hear his voice and through the Bible. And so as a church family, as God's people who know him as Father, we're going to do that shortly. And we're going to be hearing from Joshua 10 and Colin Bourne is going to be preaching for us. But before we do that, we're going to um, sing a song together, the song, Behold the Power of His Word. And it's a song that reminds us that although generations may pass, although we hit, we've been reading about Joshua, a generation that has come and gone, the word of the Lord and his promises will stand forever and are powerful. And so why don't we stand or sit as appropriate as we remind ourselves of these truths? Behold the power of his word He spoke, creation came to be I will trust his promise He hung the stars a guarantee His word is good enough for me I will trust his promise Generations rise, generations fall, but his word is living and his word is sure. trust his promise we are surrounded by his grace here in the midst of those he saved I will trust his promise generations rise generations fall But his word is living and his word is sure have heard we are a witness to the power of your word so we will tell your promises are good in Jesus Christ we have your every word fulfilled Generations rise, generations fall, but his word is living and his word is sure. Generations rise, generations fall, but his word is living. And his word is sure evermore, evermore, evermore. 
Father God, thank you that your word is powerful, that you speak to us. And as we open your word and hear from you, we meet your son, the Lord Jesus, and are transformed by your spirit into his likeness. And we pray that um, as we open your word now, that will be what you are doing by your spirit. Give us um, open hearts and ears and minds that are eager to learn from you. If we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Joyce is now going to come and um, read for us. Um, and then Colin will preach. Our reading this morning is a rather long reading. So um, why don't we all try our best to, to stay alert and attentive as Joyce reads for us. The reading from Joshua chapter 10 is on page 185 of the Pew Bibles. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors, so Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent a Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went up with all their armies <clears throat> and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekar and Machadar, and as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them, as far as Azekar, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones that the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ejelon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven, and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned, and all Israel with them, to the camp at Gilgal. These five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave at Machadah, and it was told to Joshua, 
The five kings have been found hidden in the cave at Machadah. And Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. But do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies, attack their rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. When Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished striking them with a great blow until they were wiped out, and when the remnant that remained of them had entered into the fortified cities, then all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Machadah. Not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward, Joshua struck them and put them to death. And he hanged them on five trees. And they hung on the trees until evening. But the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hidden themselves. And they set large stones against the mouth of the cave, which remain to this very day. As for Machadah, Joshua captured it on that day and struck it and its king with the edge of the sword. He devoted to destruction every person in it he left none remaining. And he did to the king of Machadah, just as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Machadah to Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord gave it also and its king into the hand of Israel. And he struck it with the edge of the sword and every person in it. He left none remaining in it, and he did to its king, as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Libna to Lachish, and laid siege to it, and fought against it. And the Lord gave Lachish into the hand of Israel, and he captured it on the second day, and struck it with the edge of the sword, and every person in it, as he had done to Libna. Then Horam, king of Giza, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua struck him and his people until he left none remaining. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Lachish to Eglon, and they laid siege to it and fought against it. And they captured it on that day and struck it with the edge of the sword, and he devoted every person in it to destruction that day, as he had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron, and they fought against it and captured it, and struck it with the edge of the sword and its king and its towns and every person in it. He left none remaining, as he had done to Eglon, and devoted it to destruction and every person in it. 
Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned back to Debir and fought against it. And he captured it with his king and all its towns. And they struck them with the edge of the sword and devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining, just as he had done to Hebron and to Libna and its king, so he did to Debir and its king. So Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country and the Negev and the lowland and the slopes and all their kings. He left none remaining, but devoted to destruction all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen as far as Gibeon. And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a huge thank you to Joyce. Well done. That was clear and helpful. And I guess that you spent some time preparing it. So thank you. Let's pray together. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us, for your presence with us, for your care of us. And we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus to overcome the power of sin and death and to lead us in newness of life. As we reflect on your word, we ask that you would help us to live in our day and generation in ways which are honoring to you and which enable others to find rest, hope, and life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Forty-three verses. A minute to comment on each? That would be 43 minutes. I'll try and do better than that, by which I mean shorter. Do you ever feel that you're alone in the Christian life? Do you ever feel, as it were, that you're fighting the enemy by yourself, that in some way you have been abandoned? I read of someone who was trying to learn to use a new computer. She was troubled by what seemed to be a sort of faint clicking sound that indicated that it seemed to be working or something seemed to be working, but nothing was happening on the screen. As you do, she phoned the helpline. I don't know how long she had to wait, but the manufacturer's representative on the helpline said, there's no problem. The computer is probably running an application you can't see, and it's working away in the background. You know, as I thought about the phrase working away in the background, I began to realize how visually oriented I am and including in my relationship with God. If I can't see something happening, I can so easily assume that it's not happening. But that's not the way God operates. God works often behind the scenes for his people and he also fights for his people if you were here last sunday when uh, the passage was joshua chapter 9 you'll have heard how israel made a league a pact if you like with the gibeonites 
the Israelites had been deceived by the Gibeonites, and that had happened because Israel hadn't consulted the Lord. They thought they knew what they were doing, and they fell into a trap. Things aren't always what they appear to be. And yet God's providence overruled the situation. These people of Gibeon, having come into alliance with Israel, served the Lord and Israel by drawing water and timber for sacrifices. They came to know the Lord. They even turned away from their idolatry. Effectively, they became a part of Israel. God turned their curse into a blessing. And, as we've heard today, God used this treaty to Israel's advantage. He had been, he was, and he is working behind the scenes for his people. First, one of our chapters today says that the Canaanite nations soon heard of this treaty that Gibeon had made with Israel. They already knew of the defeat of Jericho and of Ai. Bad news travels fast, even without the internet. Joshua 10 verse 2 gives the result. They feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities. Because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. You see, the Lord's promise that he would bring fear upon the Canaanites was being fulfilled yet again. Even though Gibeon didn't have a king, it was still a city of some reputation. Their military skill was well known. The king of Jerusalem was understandably afraid. Gibeon had become Israel's ally, and this meant that she would fight with them if asked to. And this weakened the position of the kings around. And so, as we heard, the king of Jerusalem responded by sending word to four other kings. He requested that they form an alliance to punish Gibeon for what was regarded as their treachery. He wanted to ensure that they couldn't help Israel. Therefore, we read, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Gibeon was in a desperate situation. They had five kings and their armies attacking them. What are they going to do? Well, the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. You can just imagine, who are they going to choose as their runner? Uh, the one who always outran the others, I guess. And they asked for Joshua's help, relying on him because of the covenant doesn't say that directly, but it's inferred by the remark that the Gibeonites were now the servants of Israel. And how might Joshua respond? After all, Gibeon had deceived him, and it had now backfired on them. He could just leave them to their own ends, couldn't he? But he didn't do that. He did the godly thing and honoured the covenant. And it seems that God had worked through the heart of the king of Jerusalem in the establishing of this alliance of these five kings, knowing that Israel was obliged to defend Gibeon. God's providence used these difficult circumstances for Israel's good. At the beginning of chapter 9, which sort of headlines three phases, we read that these kings decided to fight together against Israel. They made their decision, and yet God had in some way determined the attack. 
You see, up until now, Israel had been fighting against one city at a time. God had promised them the land, but if they continued one and another and another, the campaign would take a very long time. This confederation of five kings brought their armies out of their walled cities into open country to attack Gibeon. Joshua sensed that this was an opportunity to gain a great victory immediately. So he left Gilgal and ascended to Gibeon. Uh, some of you may know, others not, that this is a steep climb. It's a journey of about 25 miles. And by doing this, Israel could possess the land much faster if they managed to get there while these five armies were still there and while Gibeon was still safe. You see, God was using what seemed to be an inconvenience to help Israel. And because Joshua had faith, he saw this trial as a source of blessing. Hard though they may be, trials can enable us to grow and to accomplish even greater victories for God and his kingdom. So I wonder, when obstacles come into your life, do you become discouraged? Do you complain about it? Do you even question God's purpose in it all? Or perhaps do you see it as an opportunity to further Christ's kingdom? If God is sovereign, then we should and can accept his trials as opportunities. Some of you will know that the Apostle Paul in New Testament times was imprisoned in Rome for two years. But instead of complaining and questioning God's will, he used it as a way of sharing Christ with the guards and even with members of Caesar's household. He saw it as an opportunity to reach people he couldn't normally get to. Paul turned his trials into triumphs and he relied on God's power in his life. God reached just as many people through Paul when he was a prisoner as when he was free. So God was behind and in these events back in Joshua's time. The Lord said to Joshua, don't fear them, for I've given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. These were the words of encouragement that the Lord spoke to Joshua as they were on their way, saying that no one would be able to stand against him. It has echoes in God's promises to Joshua right at the beginning of the book, if you may remember those. He also said that he had given, had delivered them into Joshua's hand. There's a lovely verse in the New Testament which says, believe that you have received it and you will. And this is a key statement in the chapter. Five times it says that God delivered the enemy into Joshua's hands. The first 14 verses actually tell how he delivered the king's armies into Israel's hands. The next 13 verses tell God how to deliver the kings themselves into Israel's hands. And the final 16 verses tell of how God delivered their kingdoms into Israel's hands. It wasn't all at once. But through it all, Joshua was a man of great faith. He believed God. He attempted great things for the Lord. He led Israel on this all-night march to Gibeon, and under cover of darkness, they arrived, and the enemy wouldn't have suspected that. It was a daring move, and God used it to help defeat the enemy. What it did mean was that Israel had to fight immediately after a long march and without any sleep. Obviously, Joshua believed God would help them and strengthen them, and the Lord did just that. Verse 10 says that they went into a panic. Another version says the Lord confused the enemy before Israel. 
He caused them to run around in confusion. They didn't know what to do or where to go. For soldiers, that may seem like an amazing statement, but perhaps if you've got the armies of five different kings all in a group, they weren't quite sure which way to turn for orders. I don't know. God was behind it. And not only did he cause confusion, he turned the weather against them. We heard of these large hailstones raining down on them, or I should say hailing down on them. And this chilling phrase that more soldiers were killed by hail than by Israel's sword. Joshua, you know, realized that there was a big task on their hands that they wouldn't have time to complete the victory in the day. So he asked the Lord to stop the sun from moving across the sky. As we know today, of course, the sun doesn't move. It's the earth which rotates on its axis. And so some people claim that this proves the Bible is at odds with science But the terminology is still used today by the weather presenters, isn't it? If you don't mind my saying so, Sean, you said this morning that you saw the sun rise. You chose not to say the sun came into view as the earth rotated on its axis, which might be more accurate, but that's not the way we speak. A key thing here is that the people of Canaan worshipped the sun, the moon, the forces of the weather. They were their gods. Yet now Joshua had been assisted by the gods that they supposedly served. The sun somehow stood still, giving aid to Israel. Great hailstones had fallen upon them. They must have been truly panicked and discouraged to find that their own gods were either against them or overpowered by Israel's God would have said to them that Israel's God must be God. And verse 14 says there's been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. As I've been preparing this, you may not be surprised to know that there is a variety of view and opinion as to what actually happened. Was it an overcast sky so that normally in the afternoon you couldn't have fought because it would have been too hot? Well, it wasn't so hot because of the hailstorm and the overcast sky. Some scientists have reckoned that they could date a solar eclipse to that sort of period in history. I don't know. I would hazard a guess that you don't know. But God was in it. And he enabled Israel to succeed. Some time ago, I spotted a a picture in a newspaper which really caught my attention the caption was strong man and there was a photo of a workman displaying what seemed to be superhuman strength lifting a piano towards a first floor balcony an explanation under the picture plus one faintly visible clue told the unseen story. By looking closely, you could spot a cable attached to the piano, and out of shot was the crane that was lifting the piano. The real power to lift it was coming from the crane above, rather than from the man below. Even though the man below had a job to do, stopping it swinging about and crashing into the building. And perhaps that scene reminds us that the Lord works in and through those who trust him, but that it's his power and strength 
which is the key thing. God fought for Israel, and yet Israel was very much involved in it all. God had determined the outcome from the start, but Israel still had to fight the enemy. They marched all night. You may remember from earlier in the book of Joshua that that journey previously had taken them three days to do. So they were slogging it overnight to get there. It was urgent. And the slaughter at Gibeon wasn't the end of it. See, the enemy had trusted in their armies. They'd formed this confederation to increase their strength. But Joshua trusted in the Lord. And God didn't let him down. So let's just pause again for a moment and think, where does your confidence really lie? Will it lie in the new prime minister? Or perhaps the leader of the opposition or the leader of another political party? Will your confidence lie in the person we pray to be appointed here as leader of this church? Does your confidence lie in your bank balance? In other words, do you rely on human resources or on God's resources? We know what the right answer should be. And on Tuesday morning or Thursday evening, does it still seem the same as when we are gathered together? We can be functional atheists, even though we are professing Christians. And so a challenge this morning, I think, are we prepared really to trust God, to have confidence in him, to stand courageously for him? Are we prepared to pray for the lost and not simply to pray, but to witness also? Are we working out what God works in? Five kings, we heard, had escaped from the battle. They'd taken refuge in a cave at Machida. Joshua became aware of it, instructed his men to place large stones in front of the cave to trap them, set a guard, make sure they didn't escape. And then he released them to go and get on with mopping up the rest of the operation. He didn't want to waste time on these five kings right now. If they'd put themselves in a cave, they could stay there. Still too much fighting to do. Joshua commanded his people to complete the victory that God had delivered to them. And then as we heard, they returned to Machida and Joshua brought the five kings out of the cave. Commanded the army commanders to come here, put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and put their feet on their necks. Apparently a custom observed by victorious commanders in the Middle East, a symbol of complete subjugation of the enemy. Joshua told his captains, so that's what the Lord would do to all their enemies. Morale boosting, strengthening, encouraging motivating these five kings that had come together in alliance and threatened Gibeon and Israel had been totally defeated and we read of the fate of the kings put to death and impaled until evening people in Canaan believed that the king had great power often these men were great warriors having military prowess. They commanded respect from the people of the land, but Joshua wasn't afraid of them. He trusted in the Lord his God. He knew that God was greater than any king. If we try to put our trust, our absolute trust, 
in people who have positions of authority, we are in danger, as are they, of it all unraveling. Perhaps we are afraid of witnessing to people because of their position or their authority or their intellect or their temperament. But as we learn more and more, humbly and yet fearlessly, to live out our faith in the Lord, to witness to him, he will triumph because God delivers into our hands those whom he is calling. He delivered all the cities that Israel fought against. No one could stand against them, just as God had promised. The word delivered is used five times in this chapter. It's a repeated motif again and again. They fought and it was hard. But they took the cities. After fighting against them, they captured them. They took possession of them. He delivered them. God delivered them to Israel. And they struck and destroyed all that was in them, leaving none alive as God had commanded. This is hard. And if you were here four weeks ago when we were looking at the account of the destruction of Jericho, uh, I said quite a bit then about God's justice and about the wickedness of the people. I'm not going to repeat all that now, but if you'd like to chat with me afterwards, please do so. Being devoted to God means giving absolutely over to him. Joshua, time and again, lived by faith, believed God, and called on the power of God. Are you, I wonder, claiming God's promises in your life? Not for your own good, but for the good of others and the good of the kingdom. You see, God has given us all that we need for life and for godliness. He's given us the armour of God to take up each day. You can read in Ephesians 6. I'm not going to read those verses now. But we are commanded to take up, wear and use that armour. The Lord gives us our spiritual weapons for pulling down strongholds. And in our day and generation, we pray... We act with integrity. We challenge injustice. And above all, we put on love. And as the chapter comes to an end, we read of the extent of this rapid victory in the land. John, Joshua conquered all the land, the mountain country and the south and the lowland and the wilderness slopes, the boundaries are given and it's clear that this is a really significant stage in the conquest of the land. All these kings and their land Joshua took at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp at Gilgal. That's the reason they had accomplished so much in so short a space of time. God blessed their efforts. God arranged it all. So when obstacles come... Do we become discouraged and complain or see it as an opportunity to further Christ's kingdom? Where does our confidence lie? In human resources or in God's? Who do we really trust day by day? 
Are we really taking God's promises into our lives and living them out? I wonder if you ever watched uh, a water skier. As the boat's engine starts and the boat begins to move, the water skier is right down in the water. And there is a great sense of friction and of resistance. And as the speed picks up, the skier is lifted, as it were, and the skis skim along the surface of the water. Something perhaps of an analogy to our Christian experience as we may go through deep waters of trial, as we're encouraged to take advantage of God's power to lift us, to release us, and to lead us on. Yes, there may be great struggles and resistance. The weight of our own weakness may seem almost unbearable. But like the water that suddenly is under the skis, rather than pulling them down, our difficulties can challenge us to draw on God's supernatural power. Are we alone in our Christian faith? No. God is always working behind the scenes. So keep on stepping out in faith, trusting God to use your trials and challenging situations for your growth and for his glory. Amen. Thank you, Colin. We've just been hearing about the, the challenge of living um, a life under God, a life for God. And so to help us and continue, um, we're going to respond by singing together. We're going to sing a song called Undivided, a prayer that we would um, have a heart that is um, dedicated to God and for him. So why don't we stand or sit as is appropriate for us and sing together. Give me an undivided heart That I might fear your name Teach me to walk in righteous paths And follow in your ways you are gracious and forgiving, hear, O Lord, and answer me. Give me an undivided mind, that I might love your to hunger for your voice and know your spirit sword for you are good your truth's unchanging life is found in serving you undivided I want to live for you single minded that I say, all that I do, sanctify me, take me and make me new, that I might live for Christ my Lord. an undivided love for all that you desire make me a living sacrifice ignite me in your fire for 
you, O Lord, our God eternal, all my ways are known to you. Undivided, I want to live for you. Single-minded, all that I say, all that I do, sanctify me. Take me and make me new, that I might live for Christ my Lord. Undivided, counting my gains as loss, single-minded. Whatever the pain, whatever the cost, sanctify me. Help me take up my cross and live for him who died for me. Father God, thank you that you are at work in us and through us. That you are working your wills and purposes out. Father, help us to be attentive to you and to live undivided lives for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you're able to, please do remain standing as we're going to confess um, our faith in our Lord together. And by using the words of the Apostles' Creed, and declaring our faith and committing ourselves to it together. And so joining the words in bold. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please do have a seat. Um, today, we're, as a church family, we are going to be um, breaking bread and sharing wine together, remembering um, the Lord's Supper. But before we do that, we're going to spend some time praying as a church family and um, committing concerns on our hearts and minds to the Lord. Um, but first, David is going to come and share some notices to help us think how we can pray and, and what's going on in the life of the church family. Uh, the first notice was very important. On Wednesday, we have our monthly prayer meeting uh, starting at quarter to eight for an hour or so, particularly praying for God to be uh, appointing our next minister for that whole process and for us to continue to be living by faith in God that that will go ahead. The advert is still out there live on the diocesan website and on the website of C Church Pastoral Aid Society who are our patrons. So I'd urge us all to meet together Wednesday night at quarter to eight and praying for the ongoing work in this church. The second notice is next Sunday after the morning service, if you're able to, we are going to be pruning bushes and doing various other tasks in the grounds, weeding. Weeds have been growing in recent weeks. Uh, so please bring your secateurs and other instruments and tools. Um, then after that, we will have a picnic uh, together. Thank you.
My sisters and brothers in Christ, let us bring to the Lord of life our concerns and cares for the church and for the world. Lord of all, we bring before you all Christians, especially church leaders and pastors. May they remain faithful in times of trial, trusting in your everlasting love. May all who take risks to witness be given courage and inspiration. Particularly, Father, we pray for the appointment of our new minister, that this may be a person of courage and of inspiration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you all the diverse societies of our world. May your living spirit be spread to purify the corrupt, inspire the apathetic, and unlock the hearts of the bigoted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you our own circle of family and friends, all our desires and attempts to follow you, Live within us to protect, guide, and bring us to perfection in Christ. We bring before you the weak and the frightened, all who are suffering in any way. May they find you there with them and draw hope and courage from your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, Lord, those who have died in faith. May they know the joy and peace of your heaven forever. Be with any who are ill at this time, in hospital or at home. Be with the people, some from our church, who care for them. And may they know your love and peace. This week, our mission partners are Tom and Kath Swanson, serving the Lord in Africa with the African Inland Mission. Tony is in charge of the work in Nairobi and the surrounding part of the country. We pray for him as he trains leaders to carry on the mission of the church in Africa. We pray for Kath, his wife, who is in charge of safeguarding for a very, very large area of Africa as she trains people and cares for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you and praise you for all you for all you were prepared to suffer for us. Bring the light of resurrection to all our suffering until we learn to praise you even through the dark times. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, Dorothy. If you're able, would you stand as we prepare to share signs of God's peace, one with another? Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body through the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. And so the peace of the Lord be always with you. We offer one another signs of of God's peace. Thank you. I realised I won't be able to help you by holding your... No, 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 I've got David, got David lined up. Okay, yeah. great.
So as we prepare to gather around the Lord's table at his invitation and command to share in bread and wine together in remembrance of what happened that Thursday evening back in Jerusalem, and as we feed on Christ by faith, let's join together in the words of our communion prayer. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love, you gave us Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels sing your praise. We join with them in heaven's song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end, they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body given for you all. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it, and said, this is my blood shed for you all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free, defying death, He rose again and is alive with you to plead for us and all the world. This is our story. Send your spirit on us now, that by these gifts we may feed on Christ with opened eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Would you please sit? And now as our Saviour taught us, so together, let's pray, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread 
to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life Now you are exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens, for one day I'll bow. But for now, I'll marvel at this saving grace, I'm full of praise once again. I'm full of praise once again And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside once
Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life Do you stand if you want to Thank you for the cross Thank you for the cross Thank you for the cross my friend Thank you for the cross Thank you for the cross Thank you for the cross my friend And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life And once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life As we remain standing, we pray together this prayer after communion giving thanks to God and committing ourselves to serve him. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Please do have a seat. We've come to the end of the formal part of our church service together. We've heard from God's word. We've um, broken bread and wine together. And now we go out sent by him to live for his praise and glory. Um, But we do have a chance to have some refreshments together um, Grace and Irene are um, getting the tea and coffee ready as, as I speak. And so do um, stick around, encourage one another what the Lord has been teaching you, how he's been at work in your life um, as we um, share those refreshments together. But before we go, um, why don't I pray for God's blessing um, as we go out. Now may the blessing of God the Father, who made from one every nation that occupies the earth, of God the Son who brought us for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and of God the Spirit who brings us together in unity, be with us and remain with us always. Amen.